O Lord God, make your word a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart, from the heart to life and conduct, that as the rain returns not empty, so neither may your word, but accomplish all for which it is given. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, today, um, I have not been preaching for a number of weeks, but I'm returning now to the series that I began about a month ago, or, or a bit more, looking at the nature of public worship. And you might remember, late last term, we looked about the fact that there is such a thing as public worship. We looked at how the great rule of it is God's word. And then about a month ago, we looked at the shape of it, that we are in dialogue with God, our creator and our redeemer. He calls us and we respond in praise and prayer. And he communicates to us by his word and we respond with thanksgiving and he blesses us. I want to start now, as I go on for the next few weeks, to start looking at the different elements in worship. <clears throat> and the first one that we want to talk about, and that's the one we're going to be doing today, is public prayer. Public prayer. Now, prayer is a huge subject that we could spend many weeks on, but I'm going to limit myself today to prayer as we practice it when we gather together for worship. So I'm not necessarily going to speak much today about your private prayer life or prayer in small groups, but I'm speaking here of praying together as we gather in worship. Now I just spoke, didn't I, about dialogue. And if we could sum up all that God does for us when we gather together in worship, we could sum it up in his word, couldn't we? He speaks to us. God is not silent, but his word is an open book and he calls us still by this living word that we have here. But if we were to sum up all that we do in response to that word, I think the most important thing is prayer. You could almost sum it all up in prayer. If there's anything we are to do when we gather together in worship... Second only to the word, it's prayer. It's prayer. Think about after Pentecost in Acts 2, when 3,000 people are called into life in Christ at once. What do they do? They gather in the temple courts. They continue steadfastly together in what? In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the word, in the breaking of bread, quite possibly the Lord's Supper, and in prayers, or, I think a better translation, the prayers, the stated prayers of the church. Prayer must be central to our worship. But sadly, so often it's not. Sadly, so often in many church services today, it is reduced to the bare minimum. And the time for mere horizontal communication about events and about discussion and all the rest, and even fellowship, as good as that is, it crowds out prayer. But what else are we to do in the face of God, in the presence of God, than to pray to him? to open our hearts at the call of his word and offer up the desires of our hearts in prayer. Prayer must be central when we gather together in worship. <clears throat> so what I want to look at then, first of all, is the foundations of prayer. On what basis can we, as God's people, pray to God? What right do we have when we gather together to pray to God? Well, I want us to note here, first of all, 
that the great foundation of prayer is Jesus Christ himself. Think about that text that we read as our call to worship this morning. Seeing then that we have this great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, yes, let us hold fast to our confession, but then remember, he carries our nature into heaven. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? With respect to the Godhead, he is the Son of God. But with respect to us, he shares the very same nature that we have, yet without sin. He is the God-man. And that's an incredible thing. And we would think, what's our response to that? Yes, to rejoice, to marvel, to wonder, to celebrate that, to rely on that, to trust that. Yes, all of those things. But look at what Hebrews says we do. What does Hebrews say we do because of this wonderful high priest that we have? It says to there, doesn't it? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There could have been all sorts of responses All sorts of things that God might want us to do. But what's the first thing he wants us to do? To come bringing our desires, bringing our requests, to come boldly to the throne of grace, to come into his presence, to speak and to find, to ask and to receive. That's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to go on long pilgrimages or to just give away everything that we have. Sometimes we need to do that. But what he simply wants of us is that we turn to him and face him and speak to him. That's the wonderful blessing of having Jesus Christ as our redeemer, as our representative, as our priest. How do we respond? We respond in prayer. To be a Christ follower is to be a prayer. The foundation is in Christ himself. And notice there, it's let us. This is not just each of you in your own private life. It says, let us come together. And that's what we're doing when we gather. We're praying together, offering up our prayers to God. But then the other element we have here is that this Christ, who is the foundation of our prayers, the reason why we pray, the commander of prayer, has bound himself to us by covenant. You see, it's it's an amazing little thing that Jesus says, isn't that? when he goes in to cleanse the temple. I've written it there in your little insert. You know, when he chucks out all the money changers and all those who are corrupting the temple, he throws them all out. And what does he say? He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, that's surprising in one sense, isn't it? Because what do you associate mainly with the temple? sacrifices, all of the mechanics, all of the pageantry, all of the the sheer hard work of the sacrificial system. But what does Jesus say most of all? And he's following the the prophet Isaiah here. What does he say most of all? My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, what did the temple represent? The temple represented that God was amongst his people. He had promised to be amongst his people. God said, I am your God and you are my people and you will know my presence at the place that I have decided. First the tabernacle and then the temple. 
All the temples of the other nations were human initiatives to try and somehow, with increasing desperation, try and make some contact with the gods. To be able to manipulate the gods. But the temple in Jerusalem wasn't that. The temple in Jerusalem was a place where God graciously met with his people and offered them grace and commanded them with his word. He was coming to them and he was promising to them and they were responding. The temple was there because of covenant. God binding himself to us, the true and living God who could do anything he pleased, instead saying, you will be my people and I will be your God. And Jesus takes it up and he wants that for all nations, even as the prophet Isaiah predicted. He wants that for all nations. And it will no longer be in the building of the temple, it will be in him. But we're still bound to him. You know, the reason why we can pray to God is not because we're desperate as though he's never listening to us or as though we've heard nothing from him or as though we have to somehow kickstart spiritual powers so that things actually happen for us. Prayer is not manipulation. Prayer is not magic. Prayer is not bargaining. Prayer is not earning your brownie points through the exercise of your faith so that God will give you heaps and heaps of blessings in this life? Sadly, there are Christians who think that. No. Prayer is a gracious provision from our promise-keeping God. He's come to us first. And so we respond in prayer. He's telling us, come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and you'll be able to come to me. And what do you do when you come to God? You speak with him. And you communicate with him. And he speaks to you through his word. And so we together as God's people pray because we have Christ as our head and we have his covenant promises as our security, as our warrant. And so we come to pray. But then also, how do we come to pray? What right do we have to pray? Well, it links in with the catechism today. What has the Spirit given us? The Spirit has given us faith. Faith. And when the Spirit comes into your heart and transforms you, And gives you faith so that you believe in God. What do you do? See there in Galatians. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying out, Abba, Father. See, what's the sign of faith in our hearts? We cry out, Abba, Father. Dear Father. My Father. That's the direction that we're facing, isn't it, when we cry out to God? Faith speaks. Faith speaks in prayer. And in fact, you cannot exercise faith without prayer. That's the striking contrast, isn't it, in the garden back in Genesis 3. What do Adam and Eve do when they eat the forbidden fruit? When they sin against God, what do they do? They turn away. They hide. They shelter. You know, you get that same sense, don't you, at the the predictions of the end of the world, when the wicked will want the mountains to fall on them, to hide them from God. It's all about hiding. It's all about turning away. It's all about putting our eyes down. That's That's the posture of sin, is to turn away. And to be silent. But what does faith do? Faith opens up. Faith looks to God. Faith turns to God. Faith speaks with God. So if all of this is true, Christ himself, his covenant with us, the faith he gives us, 
What else would we do when we gather but to pray? What else would we want to do but pray? To be free in confessing our sins because we know that there is mercy with God. To be free in adoring him because he's first called us to himself. To be free and bold in giving us the desires of our, within our hearts because he's shaping our hearts by his word so that we know what to pray for. But we need to make sure that our worship services are structured around a reverence for prayer and a desire for prayer because it marks us out as true Christ followers. If you're saved by Christ, you're a prayer. And if we're a church of Jesus Christ, then we are a church that when we gather together publicly, we delight to offer up prayers to our covenant God according to his word. And that shows that we actually believe in faith. That faith is at the very heart of the Christian life. But then, secondly, what do we have here? We have also what we should pray for and how we should do it. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? And this shows us that Christ is our Lord. Because when he teaches us, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he teaches us, He's showing himself to be our covenant Lord, isn't he? He teaches us what the law really means. He teaches us what blessing really looks like in the Beatitudes. And he gives us a rule of prayer, doesn't he? He gives us the Lord's Prayer. That's not just a nice formula. That's not just a helpful suggestion. That comes from our covenant Lord, Jesus. And he says... This is how you will pray. And it doesn't just mean that you'll pray that prayer, but also that your prayers will flow out of the spirit of that prayer. That we will start by seeking God's honour and holiness and glory. Hallowed be your name, our Father in heaven. And then we will be praying not first for our needs, but for the progress of Christ's kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, graciously and mercifully, God wants to hear our desires, our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. But as we do so, we know that we are sinners. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And we humbly acknowledge our need of his grace and of his spirit. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For all the glory belongs to him forever and ever. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. See there, Jesus is teaching us how to pray. If we're ever stuck for words, we know where to turn. We know what to say, what to meditate on, to chew over in our hearts as we come to God in prayer. But I'd suggest to you the great priority that shines through that prayer is we want to see the kingdom of God advanced. We want to see the kingdom of God advanced. And that should especially be true when we gather together as God's people. Here we are in public. Yes, we pray for our individual concerns and the problems of this life. Yes, we pray about that. But here we are in the presence of God. We're at the throne of his grace. We've talked about this, haven't we? We're in in heavenly places when we gather together by his spirit. Surely that's what we want to pray for? You know, in Revelation 5, verse 8, it talks about bowls of incense in the heavenly throne room. And it says, these bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. What do you think those prayers are all about? Surely they're about the advance of the kingdom shown in that royal heavenly throne room. I don't want to say too much about that verse. I don't want to steal thunder from Douglas when he's preaching on it next. But don't we see that there? Those bowls of incense are surely filled with the desires of God's people for God's kingdom. 
So especially when we gather together, that should be the core of our prayers to see the kingdom of Christ advance. But then as we see in Paul, Paul elaborates on that further, doesn't he, in 1 Timothy. The concerns of all people should be included in our prayers and especially those in authority. But once again, why is it important to pray for those in authority? Well, Paul goes on immediately again to talk about the gospel. There is one Lord and Saviour, Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Even the prayers for governors and kings and rulers and politicians, even those prayers are ultimately about advancing God's kingdom and the gospel going through the earth. But notice there too what Paul says in verse 8. He wants all men everywhere to lift up their hands in worship so that they're not quarrelling and in dissension and struggling for power themselves. Isn't that interesting? We are to assemble for prayer because prayer is what you do instead of being hungry for power. You deny yourself that lust for power struggling with others and instead we as God's people show ourselves not to be power hungry despots but prayers to the true despot to the true sovereign the Lord Jesus who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and that's so crucial isn't it prayer is the life of faith quarreling and power seeking is therefore the life of unbelief You think somehow that that is going to get what you need. And Christians do that all the time, within the church and out of it. Thinking that by grasping the levers of power, we can get what we need for the church and for God's kingdom. But don't be fooled. Instead, Paul says he wants men to lift up their hands in prayer to God, depending on him for all that we need. (coughs) Now you can see here, can't you, And we'll see in a moment with the prayers we're going to go through a little bit later from Daniel and Acts. You can see here just how careful the scriptures are about instructing us in prayer. Sometimes when we get together to pray, our prayers simply become a long catalogue of various individual complaints and needs. Often of a medical nature, isn't it? about this sore knee here, this diagnosis over there, this problem over here. Now, it's not wrong to pray for those things, but they bulk much larger in our lists of prayer points than they do in the scriptures, don't they? What bulks large in the scriptures? The advance of the kingdom of Christ and the spread of the light of God's word across the earth. And the bringing of ourselves and others into Christ's kingdom. And our greater and nearer likeness to Christ as he shapes us and renews us. That's the critical priorities of the Bible's attitude to prayer. And that shows us too then that prayer is to be shaped by God's word. And so as a result, when we gather together as God's people, inevitably prayer is largely going to be done by those who are instructed in the word and are set up as instructors in the word. Because we want our prayers to be biblical and balanced, don't we? Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that when I'm up here praying, that I'm the only one praying here? No. And we need to have a strong sense that even in our silence, for most of us, we're still worshipping God. Now those great words in John 4, 24, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Where is the true heart of worship? Even when we're gathered together as God's people, where is the true reality of worship? It's not something you can see. 
It's not always something you can hear. It's not always something you can touch. It's the Spirit. It's in the Spirit, by faith, that we all together worship. And when I, as the leader, verbalise a prayer, that's just me as the servant providing the form and you take that form and we together make it our prayer by the Spirit. So don't somehow think that as you listen when I pray up the front that somehow you are being passive. You are not. We are all together worshipping God in that prayer. It is our prayer. And that's why I need to be careful and anyone else leading in prayer needs to be careful that it's biblical, that it's balanced, that it seeks God's glory and your ultimate spiritual good. But then you take that up and from the heart, by the Spirit, you are offering that up in prayer to God. The few, yes, on behalf of the many, but the many still together in worship. Well, finally then, let's just look at a couple, the two examples of prayers that we had in, that we had read out for us. And we'll see these same things here too, won't we? Got that amazing prayer in Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, that amazing prayer of confession. Daniel meditates on this revelation of the length of Jerusalem's captivity in in Babylon. And he is moved to pray, isn't he? And once again, it's one man praying. It's just one man praying, but this is a prayer in the word now for all of us. That shows us again, doesn't it? The one praying, but the many joining. And there he prays, and it's sort of a wonderful prayer of confession, isn't it? Because it acknowledges God's word. It acknowledges the covenant that God has placed on his people. And it sees his own lack and the shame, not only of himself, but the leaders and all the people before God. He's full and free in confessing his sin and the sins of his people. He's full and free in doing that. That's another aspect of boldness. We are bold even to confess our shame before God. But then notice here, he comes to God with reminders of God's own saving mercies. Verse 15, you saved us in Egypt. Verse 17 and 18, you are a compassionate God, full of compassion. And so we bring our prayer to you. What a wonderful prayer that unites all the people of God in service to God. We look to his word. We fully confess from the bottom of our hearts our sins. But we humbly plead, not our own ideas of God's mercy, but God's own revelation of his mercy. We point to the things that God has done. And that's what we trust in. So that's a wonderful hope that we see in Daniel 9. But then also in Acts 4. This is one of my favourite prayers in all the Bible. There we have the apostles preaching Christ, being persecuted, being told to stop, being told to shut their mouths and not mention the name of Jesus. And they refuse. They will obey God and not man. But they come back to the church. And they relate to the church this terrible struggle. And the fact that they want the, 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 the authorities want the gospel to be silenced. Notice here, what is the first thing they do? Do they get their legal advisors? Do they set up a defense fund? Do they take up arms? Do they do the ring around? To, you know, some of them must have known some influential people. Do they go to them? No. They turn in prayer. 
That's the first thing they do. They are bold to pray. And that's because they know who God is. And they're grounded in who God is. Notice there, they're informed by God's word. They, they recite Psalm 2 together. The nations rage. And they point to all of these authorities, Herod and Pontius Pilate and the other leaders, all surrounding them. And they can see, yes, God knows that this is happening. His word tells us. And so we would return to God with God's words on our lips in our prayer. And it's through that that we interpret what we see around us. And we convert it all into prayer. And notice here, when it comes to the concerns of this world, they don't ask for much specific stuff there, do they? What do they ask of God? They ask for God in his justice simply to look on their threats. That's all they say. Notice that they don't say, God, could you please change the policy of the Sanhedrin? Could you please give us a defender? Could you please make things easy for us? What do they say? They simply say, Lord, we ask you to look on that. You're the sovereign God. You will deal with that as you see fit. But notice here, what do they want? They want God to deal with them. And what do they want? They want God to give them boldness to be faithful witnesses. Whatever happens out in the world, at least, God, make us a faithful witnessing church to you. That's what they want. That we may continue, whatever happens, to proclaim your gospel. And what happened? The spirit moved amongst them and they sh the whole place shook and the word went out with authority. And that should still inform, once again, our prayer, shouldn't it? Yes, we pray for all men everywhere. We pray for all peoples everywhere. We pray for all authority leaders everywhere. But in the end, we leave them to God. But when it comes to us and to the kingdom of Christ, we know what we pray for. And we have a right to pray for those things. Because Christ is our king. And we are his covenant people. And the spirit has given us faith. So that we may know and taste and see that the Lord is good. And so we pray to him. And may that be our attitude now and always. May South Yarra always be a praying church, not just in, in private, not just with small groups, but together as we worship. May we use this heavenly privilege and bring our prayers to God. Well, let's pray now. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great privilege of prayer. May we always use it to your glory. And may we always uphold the name of Christ. And may he be our confidence, our delight, and our great pleasure. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.